Jeff Van Drummond. I'm one of the three partners of Oski Blue. The other two partners are over there, John Kendall on the left and Troy Braithwaite on the right. Um, we were asked by Collin County just to kind of do a little bit of workshop on entrepreneur stuff. So I'm kind of planning on, uh, you know, talking a little bit about the businesses that we've worked on in the past. All three of us have started businesses. Some have been successful, some have not, but I don't know if you'll ever meet a real entrepreneur that hasn't failed at least at one or two businesses. Let me just briefly talk about um, each of us. So Troy, as I mentioned before, is over on the right. And inside of Oski Blue, we're the three partners of Oski Blue. We're a local SEO and web company. We do custom software development. We do a lot of different stuff. You know, at the end of the day, anyone that has a small business does a lot of different stuff. And anyone that's an entrepreneur probably has done a lot of different things. Um, Inside of our company, we have three kind of different roles. Troy does marketing and money. John gets us clients. John's the reason we eat every single day. Without John, we wouldn't eat. <laughs> and then I'm the guy who makes sure that the things that John sells, we actually can make get delivered. You know, I manage day-to-day -day production, make sure the things that we, we do actually <coughs> And those are kind of our different roles inside of there. As I mentioned before, we've all started businesses. We've all um, been successful and been unsuccessful. Here's kind of just the outline of the night. What's an entrepreneur? I'm just going to take a couple minutes talking about that before we jump in. Then Troy's going to, he's got seven lessons from Troy, which I think are really fantastic. I'll talk about systems, technology, sorts of things you need to keep think about getting started. Uh, John's going to talk about sales, learning how to set up, market your business, and get going. And then we'll have at the end a general Q&A where you guys can ask us any other questions. All throughout, though, ask questions as you're kind of going along there, okay? So there's so much that goes into business and so much you have to think about when you're starting up a business. But I think it kind of, it, it gets a good line out there because there are a lot of businesses that fail, and including some that I started to pass because I, I'm admittedly not an entrepreneur, ironically enough, even though I've built businesses and sold them. Troy is an entrepreneur in the like deepest sense of the word out of all of us. Troy is the entrepreneur out of all of us. I'm a manager. I am great at systems. I'm great at putting systems together. But what makes Oski Blue great is that we have <coughs> partners that we're able to work together with. So we have people with vision and sees opportunities and makes things happen, and we have people who can make those happen. And then we, of course, have somebody who can actually sell anything to anybody anywhere, which always helps out any partnership. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and I just turn some time over to Troy now and uh, let him jump into his seven lessons. This is my favorite thing, like with business, at the end of the day, I always see it's a wild ride. Like there's no part about it. If you're going to get an entrepreneurship, there's nothing not wild about it. Um, this is what I always say because it is. It's it's a adrenaline, and more than likely, yes, that guy's going to stay on for a second, but he's probably going to fall off. He's probably going to maybe get hurt, bruised up a little bit. And I know for me, I definitely have, have, have taken a few rides and got bucked off a couple times, but uh, getting back up is, is, really, is really the key. So the biggest thing is, for me, like I think of it like just, just do it. Like if you're going to, like I find a lot of people um, that want to get into the business or they have this idea, and, and they never get off, off the boat to do it. They have these things and they're always very hesitant. And it, you know, it's really, you know, I really like this. It says, quitting, quit making excuses, putting it off, complaining about it, dreaming about it, whining about it, crying about it, believing you can. Worrying if you can, waiting until you're older, skinnier, richer, braver, <laughs> we're all around better. Suck it up, hold on tight, say a prayer, make a plan and just do it. Uh, with a lot of entrepreneurs, it's, the ones that I've seen that have taken off successful, <coughs> they just get out there and they, and, they, and they do it. And you know, but you have that plan ahead of time and, and just and just do it. And and this will this next slide is <coughs> part of the businesses that one of them that I kind of run right now. The last little bit is the gifts for men outlet. So an opportunity came up as we were um, with Oski Blue. Hey, we it started off kind of like a a way we could move some product for somebody and then it turned out into a business. And you can see, this is about 12 months into it. This is this last Christmas, this is my house. So right up here, this is, this is my entryway. This, these are shipments getting out. So we did about $200,000 of revenue in December out of my front door. It's one of those things where, I was talking with my, my brother-in-law and we were talking about this business and I, I told him that I had, um, I had 30 pallets of product coming. I was like, well, where, where's it going to? I was like, well, I haven't figured that out yet. So I have 30 pallets of product I just bought. It's on a semi, and I have no place for it to go. And I'm trying to put people off. Oh, yeah, you know, let me get that address for you. You know, I'll email you tomorrow with it. You know, so it's one of those things like most people would be scared out of their mind because they never even get close to that. For me, I'll, hey, I'll buy the product, 
get it here. By the time you get here, I'll have an address for you to drop it off at. You know, and it's one of those things that, hey, just do it. If you're gonna do it, get into it and handle it. And really, it comes down to like this. I like it, hey, be committed. You know, a lot of times you're on that edge, people can't come off. This is the best example I can see committed. Once you take that leap, I mean, you're, you're fully committed. And I think with, with small business and entrepreneurs, the one that do it, they have to throw themselves all the way in. By doing that, they can be successful. So for me, I, I apologize. I have a, a degree in accounting. I always knew that I'd probably own a business, and I figure, hey, I need to understand numbers. Because numbers is the language of business. And so after I graduated, um, I was going to start a mortgage company, and the laws were changing, so it didn't make it possible. And so I was just trying to find different things to make money. And my wife, she decided to go out, she was going to start looking for a job. So she went and applied at this accounting firm. My wife's really smart, and they didn't hire her. And I said, that's, that's kind of garbage. You know what? I'll hire you. So we found a course, hey, this is how you're going to start your own accounting practice. Um, we went to it as a couple thousand dollars. We bought a computer on a, a credit card, bought QuickBooks, and when the, when the new year started, we hit it up. And one of the interesting things in November, I'd run, run into a guy um, that I knew from a, year, a few years before, and him and his wife were in school and they needed an internship. So I said, hey, I'll, I'll give you an internship. And so I gave him an internship, a business I hadn't started yet. I already had some interns coming down. <laughs> so they came down at a three bedroom place and they lived in one of it. We had our office in the other, and then us, my wife, and the baby in the other. And we pretty much, I was in a new location where I didn't know a soul in the city. And we got a list of all the businesses, and we just put this aggressive plan out. We pound them with, with, with direct mail. He'd go out, set appointments, I'd go and sell it. So we started from there, and within six months we had an office uh, with full of people, which is always fun. And and then run into all those problems that small businesses have. Uh, probably one of the funnest ones is I think a lot of times going into a small business, you know, for us, I was young, out of school, so I tried to overcompensate. Maybe I tried to, I brought on this guy that had 30 years of experience. And the, the best part about being an entrepreneur is you get really fun lessons. So this guy, he was with me for two months, and I paid him about nine, Nine to twelve thousand dollars, and he lost me a seventeen thousand dollar client. You know, so that's those are one of the fun things about business. You hire the wrong people, I get to pay this guy, and he loses me my big clients. You know, so that's one of the things with some of the entrepreneur stuff that happens is you learn <coughs> really fast. Your mistakes you learn, they cost you a lot of money, and but that's part of the program is learning. One of the things with kind of the the business I started off with being an accounting an accounting bookkeeping type firm, I saw tons and tons of businesses, their financials, case studies, living, live case studies that I got to see businesses that succeed, what's making them succeed, what's making them fail. So that knowledge that I was able to gain off other people's mistakes and the ones that I was making really helped speed up my learning curve quite a bit. I've got three different companies, like chiropractor companies, three different ones that I did their, their books, I also did their taxes. Pretty much I can see these three different companies from the inside out. I know everything about them. And they started about the same time. And it was really interesting to see the three. There was one person, he was just kind of trying to do it on the side. And his life was like this. He never really, he never made that jump. And he never really made any money. And he was looking to move and, and look for this other opportunity because he never put it in 100%. And this other one, they went out. There was two of them and they, they partnered together. And one thing that they did really good is they, they found their niche. So they were gonna go into chiropractic, but they were gonna specialize, specialize in people that golf. Pretty much, I guess, with their swing, maybe their back. So they specialized in a little community. They specialized in it. They took reasonable salaries. You're starting off a business, you know what? Oh yeah, maybe a chiropractor should make 100,000. Well, if you don't have any sales, you shouldn't be trying to pay yourself $100,000. They paid themselves, and as the business grow, grew, they raised their, their, their wages, and they had a very profitable business. Um, over probably about 18 months, they were getting to the point where they were able to pay themselves about $10,000 a piece. Then there was another one that started about the same time, there about a year before, and there was three of them, and they were bringing in another guy. 
So they're like, oh, we're chiropractors, you know, so we should have big wages. So they lived off debt. They were able to get big loans. They had a big office. They even had a little satellite office. And they advertised very heavily, but they never were making money. The whole time that I was watching them, we had to prep their books again for another loan because they were never making money. They were full staffed. They had the appearance of success. But then the day their bottom line was that. And they brought in another guy that graduated. Oh, he should make $8,000 because that's what chiropractors make. No, it doesn't work that way. And if starting a business, you have to have that realistic expectations. What do the numbers tell me? And, and what, what's a reasonable thing? If you need $10,000 to live and you go start a certain business that's going to take a long time to get there, how are you going to compensate your wage and tell that benchmark of 10 months out where you're going to get that? That's the biggest thing is making sure you have that plan because then today, the, the dramatics and how much those people make was critical on doing that, and that really comes down to like that lean, learning, running a lean, really lean business. This part is another thing like learn from rich people and listen to them, and that can come from books and other things. Like one of the things with me, with being starting out just right out of college is, I was very hungry for knowledge. So for me, my company, we were really small. I spent probably the second most money in advertising in the in the area for an accounting firm. The other one had like 80 accountants, then there was me. And the other thing I did, I spent a ton of money on different people. I went out, uh, John Jan, Suck Tape Marketing. I found him, he had like licensed marketing coaching. So about a year and I went out and got licensed with him. I paid him and, and learned from, from him and his systems. Instead of reinventing the wheel, I went out there and got that and then I plugged it into my business. So for me, our business took off for a year, it was going really well. I could grow it pretty much as fast as I want. And then about a year in, I was like, holy cow, we didn't need to systematize our business. That's going to kind of come back to like the E-Myth. We need to put systems in. So why my wife and we brought in a, a manager to systematize it, that's when I got into marketing, coaching, consulting. And about eight months later, we're getting ready to grow the business. This was in 08. Um, we went to a training in, in Florida from a guy that this thing came in the mail, hey, learn how to take your bookkeeping company virtual and paperless. We went down there and we learned how to take this paperless. Of all the things though, that guy taught me, probably the most, it was worth every penny, is he talked about billing weekly. So most accountants, and we were no different, we bill an hourly, and you know, we'd rack up a month of thing and then we'd send them a bill. So I learned from this guy, hey, you don't know, you bill weekly and bill auto pretty much you're going to pull from their bank account. And that little piece really, I mean, that piece of advice really changed my life and saved my business. Because we went back, we were ready to go back and, and blow up our business. And that was right at the end of 08. And we marketed really heavy and staffed really heavy right into a free fall. The economy, we lost 40% of our clients to bankruptcy in a three month period. Where we were at is a very heavy construction base. And it was, it was wild. People that had $100,000 credit cards, all of a sudden, they wouldn't have any access to them. The banks just took it away. The whole thing just free fell. And it was, it was wild. It was like that, that, that bull. Pretty much, it was, it was bucking. And, um, but it's one of those things to adapt. You have to adapt. And with that, I saw that I'm seeing it for myself, but I'm seeing it in 20, 30 different other companies' businesses, what's going on. And, 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 and it's that trend. And I didn't, it's not until I look back to it that, that, it, that it made sense for us. And one thing I learned at that thing, learning from the rich people, is, is really understanding cash flow. That one piece of knowledge that I got there, mm -hmm. so we ate extremely hard. I lost my office and lost my house. We moved into a basement and so times are tough and I, I think to myself, I went to this thing, I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna raise my prices by 400%. And so that's what we did. We decided to raise and said, like, oh, times are tough, let's cut our prices. No, we raised our prices four times a month where people were paying me 300 a month, they started paying me 300 a week. We went paperless, we went virtual. I was able to double the business back up that, that next year, lean it off when we sold it at the, um, the middle of 2010. But it's understanding that cash flow. And during that year where, where businesses were falling off and that, going back in, and watching those different things, 
made a big difference. And one of our clients was uh, an auto body shop, and his that industry was hit really hard there because people, if they got in a wreck with times tough, they would just keep that money and they wouldn't do that. So their whole industry was dropping a lot. And one of the things I learned about that with, from a number standpoint, because he was doing two, he did about two and a half million that year. He'd been doing about three and a half the year before. But what we were able to do, we brought him in, we had weekly numbers with him and I'd sit down and we got so he knew, he got to the point where he knew, okay, every month I need this, this much revenue every single week. And he started watching his, his expenses extremely sharp. When things were off on our numbers, he would go out and practice with them. He was able to improve his margins by 10% by looking at weekly numbers. And that pretty much saved his business. Another thing with cash flow, so one of the later clients that I had in my last year in our accounting firm was, um, we, we hit up a company, they had a pool table company. And they also sold a lot online. They sold dart boards and they sold darts. So we came in, they, did, they needed their taxes done. So we're getting them in like a March and they haven't done any books for the previous year. And we went back, we did it. It's always fun to sit down with, with financials with somebody like that. So dealing with companies that have inventory, knowing your numbers is even more critical because they've lived a year, at this point 16 months, and they lost over $100,000 that year. They were losing $10,000 a month, but from a cash flow standpoint, they were fine because they had inventory. So they were selling it, they were selling things for a loss, but they didn't know, they didn't know they were losing. So if, if, if money's okay, if you're getting enough in the bank and you're thinking everything's okay, it's gonna come to a crashing halt. You know, you're, oh, you're hiring a couple friends. Why, because there's money in the bank. I'm feeling good about life because there's money in the bank. But all of a sudden, once I started getting in with them, we started sitting down monthly, oh, you lost $10,000 this month. You know, all of a sudden you start looking, okay, well, things need to change your next month. You know, you might need to start looking at letting somebody go. And there's very few people that I've ever sat down with with a few months in a row and showed them $10,000 losses, but they don't make changes. But if you don't know your numbers, you can go a long time not understanding that cash flow. So that's, that's a really critical thing. Even for like gifts for men. So gifts for men made some money last year, but in a product inventory business, that profit's all in product. It's reinvested in that. So you run into cash flow problems with, oh great, you run a profitable business. It's hard to even pay your taxes. Why? Because the money I need to pay for taxes is in product. The other thing when it comes to business setup and starting a business that I, I really enjoyed doing numbers of the same business in the same area and watching it. Do you like to look important or do you like to make money? There's different things that people tell you you need to be. This is how it should be done. And then there's real life and adjustments. So we did auto repair shops. We had three different ones. One of them, their rent was about $1,500, a smaller plot kind of off the road, off the part of town. And a smaller shop he kind of did by himself. He had one other person help him. Then another one that was a little bit bigger. They're about $3,500 a month in rent, a little bit more overhead, different expenses. And then there was another one, they were about 8,000 a month. It was actually a franchise, it was a 2 next, and its location was prime. It was right off the freeway, they had a big sign up there. Uh, so he paid 8,000, but he also had to pay royalties. So where this one, it might look prestigious. They, they looked fancy, they had a great location. The guy made no money. He was trying to sell it to, this other shop that did $3,500. Hey, come buy this. Why, because sure, it looked great from the outside, but the numbers never worked out. The guy down the road that ran that little shop, he was more independent, but he was a lot more profitable. He was bringing home a lot more money. And I see that all the time. I see, hey, do you want to look important or do you want to make money and be able to pay the bills? There's a big difference there. And with that, it was so just right in front, like holy cow, like same business, few different angles how to run that business and it really impacted the bottom line. And being able to adapt, so for us, when we, when we in the, the one business, pretty much learn and be able to adapt as you go. For us, it was going paperless. Hey, you know, we can charge more money, we can go paperless and come up with a new system, but we've got to go after a higher clientele. That's going to be able to save us, those different type things. So it's, 
And sometimes it's, it's asking the right questions. And one thing that as you're starting off different businesses, a lot of times if you are running with little overhead, one thing that I always made sure is I didn't discount my rate because of it. So we were doing bookkeeping taxes out of our house when we ended the business. But when we went to do taxes, I didn't discount it. Just because I'm not paying for a huge building and overhead, I didn't discount my work. That's not my problem. So a lot of times it's knowing your value. For a service that you're providing, just because you're starting off in that, you don't need to discount your rate. Don't be scared to charge market value. You know, other, because other people have overheads and different things like that, you shouldn't go out and change your business model because of it. And that's a lot of people do that. And, and that can be a, a very bad thing to get into because when you go to scale, you're not charging enough to pay for all those other expenses that are going to be coming down the road. If you start off charging <coughs> high, as you grow, you're in position to get that building, to get that other thing. For us, we this is my first month in a warehouse with Gifts for Men Outlet. So we've been in business for 16 months, and we're finally getting it. You know, for our uh, Oski Blue, two and a half years we ran it virtually, and then we got offices. So. You can do a lot of things virtual and keep the overhead down and run those businesses. Analyze and focus on your profit center. So this right here is a really important thing because as you get out there, if you're starting a business and you don't exactly know what's going on, as, as I have in lots of businesses, it's looking at your profit centers. And so we come down. How I, I find my profit centers in my businesses is I would create a little, little bar. And so these are the people down here. Pretty much if I don't like them, I make a little more. These are the people that I like. If I like up here would be not profitable. And these would be profitable clients. So I come through here and I go through my client list. So I did this a couple times. Pretty much it's, re it's a really good idea to do once a year. And I'd go through and say, okay, here's this person. Well, this person, yep, they're profitable. You know, this person right here, they're profitable. I like them. And I'd see where people end up. And what you want to do is you want to find these people right here. Pretty much people that you like and people that are profitable. And then go through and start finding the char characteristics of those people. What are their income? What are things that they do on the weekends? Your best market material and everything like here is analyzing these people. And then what you want to do is look for the things here, and you want to get rid of these people. Because that's the biggest point. One of the things that helped me springboard is, as we started our thing, you, you do anything. If anybody wants you to do something, hey, do payroll, you bet we do payroll. We'll figure out payroll. We have payroll. After doing this thing, after doing this workshop, after learning from you know, this model from John Jantz, which he'd be paid a lot to be a consultant, I was able to go get training, I came back and did this to my business, and I, I figured this person right here was a payroll client. I didn't charge them much money. They didn't make much money. And I'd have to go hand over this, this quarterly thing. Hey, here's your thing you need to sign. And by the way, you got to pay the government $46. She'd have a heart attack on me. Ah, uh, uh, 46, ah, uh, it was just a place. And I was just like, and then I, she had to pay me $50 for three months of this, and it's just like, that was painful, that was miserable. So you know what, we ended up going through and we ended up selling off our payroll, which helped get us a, a cash injection and help us so we could really target and market these people right here. And that's what really helped take my business off that next year is getting rid of either firing a map <coughs> And then going to sales appointments and listening to people like, you know what? No, if you can't do that, you're not a, an ideal client for me. Being able to say no to a business is really what gets you up here and can take the business to the next level. On a service business, it can be that way. There's going to be a certain type of clients that you're going to make all your money. They're going to be 20% of your clients is going to make you 80% of your profit. And, and your profit centers can be, if we look at a product business, so we had a client to own a gas station. There's pretty much only two gas stations up there. If you have a gas station, you can come buy product from the guy that brings it to you. You know, and they have a certain price. But to him, that didn't make sense. If he went down to the city and bought it from Costco, his margins were a lot better. He thought outside the box. A lot of times if people tell you it's a certain way, 
looking out the other side of the box. But for him, by doing that, that became a profit center. The other thing that was his profit center, which a lot of people don't think of, so he has this gas station, he has a tire center. All of his profit was in an ice machine. He bagged his own ice. So this guy would take off two months a year and go stay in his house in Hawaii and just close down the gas station because he could. Pretty much all this year, this little ice machine, he said he'd walk by all the time, and he'd just lean against it and just give it a rub. And walk <laughs> you know, it, it can be random things like that that can be your profit centers. And if you're aware of it, that can make a big difference in your business and your bottom line. And that's really the key to figure that out. That's where this kind of comes into play. Where are those profit centers? Who are my profitable people? And sticking with those. Because that's the end of the day, readapting is going to make um, those happen. So those are some lessons for me. All right, let me talk about systems and technology just a little bit about um, kind of going along here. How's everybody doing? You guys doing yeah. right? Good. You're alive? Yeah. The boys a little cold ice cream. cream. I don't have ice cream. Does anyone else have ice cream? I'm going to send a runner out to get some ice cream. Lame. Um, I, I am grateful to work with Troy because he is a, truly one of those visionary people, and I, I will talk about that a little bit. So, a little bit about my background. Um, I am one of those people who was on both sides. I worked for the University of North Carolina for a really long time um, as a tech guy, a web developer. I worked for them for about, um, I don't know, eight or nine years. And, and during that entire time I was working for them, I was also building up Vans websites. Jeff Van Drill, I know, very unique. <coughs> I a lot, a lot about the branding on that one. Um, uh, on the side, I basically found out that I could I could build websites and people would pay me money for it. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> I can actually make money doing this? And it was so exciting for me because I was doing something that I loved. I was building websites and people were paying me. Um, and I started kind of building up this side business over the years as I as I worked at UNC. And um, eventually it kind of got to the point, though, where it just I had too many clients, too many people that needed my time and I couldn't handle it anymore. You know, it's just one of those things where I, I just can't do this all day, every single day. It was, uh, it was really uh, quite a lot. You know, I, it was basically I was working eight hours a week because I had my 40 hour a week job, plus I had 40 hours a week that I needed to spend working on Vans websites and keeping my clients happy and, and, I, and I couldn't handle that anymore. And so I approached a friend of mine and said, hey, can I sell my business to you? I, what I had done over the years in order to make sure that I could manage this 80 hour a week job is I had built systems. I had technical skills that allowed me to optimize and automate so much of the business. Billing I didn't have to deal with because I built it into the system. All sorts of support was built into the system. Every single month my clients were automatically billed and they automatically got a certain number of hours of support each month and you know I didn't even know half the time what I was doing. I'll be honest, I was just like, well it would be nice if I did this, so I built it. Right? I code it out and I make it do something. Well, when I approached my friend and I and I said, you know, hey, I, you want to take, you want to buy my business from me? Um, he was he was open to the idea, but then I showed him my back end and he was like, whoa, this is amazing. You know, th does this system come with it? <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, yeah, you can have my system. <laughs> and I also had people in place. I found good partners, good technical partners that could help that went with the business. Everything that they needed to take over my business and then and make their business better came with it. Um, so kind of one lesson, and you know, I, I'm kind of couching my area and just, I just want to give you some nuggets that I think are really useful. Things that will help in your business. When you're starting a business, you need to figure out ways to automate it so that you can so that um, you, you, you can become a competitive advantage. And in the business world, that's a really important thing. You've got to have some sort of niche. You've got to have a way to be able to be better than your competition because there's always competition out there. My tech trainers, this is one of the, the businesses that I started that I learned the most from because it was a, a total failure. <laughs> it, was a, it was one of those businesses that I invested a lot of money in. What I did with this business is I, I, I wanted to move back to Texas. My family's here, I was out in North Carolina. And you know, I started up this business, I'm investing the money that I have in the bank, my savings, all sorts of stuff into this business. I, you know, things are going okay, I build up what, what I think is a great business, and it, and it really was a good business. I had all the planning, I had all the model. I built this entire business up, only to realize that I can't get clients because I don't have John. I don't have this guy that can sell anything to anybody because I'm not a salesman, I'm a technician, I'm a manager, I'm the guy that can build these things and put these things together, but I don't have really good systems for marketing. And so, you know, I try to learn marketing, I try to <coughs> figure out my way as best that I can, but 
um, in the end, it's just not a good fit for me. On, this, on the idea of finding good partners, um, you know, I should really let Troy tell this story, but he reaches out to me one day on LinkedIn, right? He, he reaches out to me, I live here in the area, and he's like, hey, uh, we should talk. I came across him online, and he, to me, he was a perfect person. I knew that he could handle what we need to. Up to this point, me and John had had the business two, two and a half years, a web SEO company. Neither of us know how to program anything. It was kind of one of those things, figure out a business and then get the right people in place. And so I found him, I was like, this guy can pretty much do anything that I ever need and want, and we're gonna meet. And what, what was neat about this sort of experience for me was that, you know, like, I love business, I love starting a business, but I would never have the courage to do it again after the experience of my tech trainers, experience of those things, and I have a family. I had four kids to support, I had a wife, partners uh, allowed me to be able to go and work on business much better. Um, it allowed me too to also not like eat it. When you're working by yourself, my tech trainers, another thing about that one that I think, another reason, there's probably a bazillion reasons why that business failed, but one big one was that I was doing it alone. There was no partners, there was only my mind, and, and as, as proud as I might be about the things that I can do, when I'm able to bounce things off of Troy and John, it's, it's better. When you have someone else that you can work with, that you can collaborate with, that you can talk through, it's gonna be better, and usually it's worth the investment as long as you find the right people to kind of work with. So that's kind of a, an, an interesting idea. Um, another principle that I think is really important that you can innovate anywhere. You know, I've always been an innovator. Um, I worked for the University of North Carolina, as I talked about, and one of the initiatives uh, on campus at UNC, um, it was the, the web infrastructure was crazy. There was web systems across the entire university. This is a, a huge research one university. You know, we have hundreds of departments and each department had their own web system. Well, I decided that we needed to have WordPress on campus. So I, um, I went to my boss and my boss thought I was crazy and I said, hey, I want to start this WordPress initiative. I want to build a WordPress multi-site here on campus. And he looked at me and said, all right, well, if you can find people to do it with you, go ahead. So I just, like any young person, I just said, all right, I'm just gonna do it. And I went and I found people on campus and I, and I just sent them all these notes, people I'd never met before, but I knew that they, would, they had the skills that I needed. And I said, we're gonna have lunch. Come to lunch, we're gonna make this happen. And I basically said to them, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna build this thing on campus and you're gonna, you're gonna be a part of it. You're gonna provide the server, you're gonna do the coding, you're gonna do this and I'll run this sort of thing. Um, what happened of it, um, I built this system up and is what happened with, the, with it is within six months, we had about 100 sites on there and maybe about uh, 200 users. The next year, we had about 2,000 sites and about 5,000 users. And what they ended up doing at UNC is they used the, they replaced all the campus work, um, web systems with this content management system. Everything on campus was consolidated into one single web system where they didn't have all this disparate stuff anymore. Save the university millions of dollars. I'm not even joking, millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, millions and millions of dollars because they didn't have all these web systems anymore. All because some guy who, and at the time I was an instructional technologist. I wasn't a leader, I wasn't a manager, I wasn't anything but some guy that worked inside of, I wasn't even in the main IT group. I was in the arts and sciences IT as an instructional technologist who created this system which replaced the campus system. They, of course, created jobs for me. I led up the initiative. They, you know, I, I helped the migration and everything that happened for moving UNC over to the system. Now, if you go to UNC and any other site at unc.edu, they're all run off of this multi-site network that I, that I started and built up just because I had the courage to say something. Now, I think you can innovate anywhere. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, being an entrepreneur it is about more about innovation than anything else and having the courage to try something. You know, speak out and say something. It doesn't mean that you have to leave your job. Um, I'm all about taking risks. Uh, Google Eyes, this is a book that I wrote. Back in 2008 or so, Google was pretty big and they were making a big uh, push at becoming um, a competitor to Microsoft with Google Apps. And, you know, I, I just have this eternal optimism that it doesn't matter what, ma what people say, I can just call anybody and try to make anything happen. So I, I called Google. I figured out a way to try and get in contact with Google. Back then it was pretty hard to figure that out. But I did and I ended up getting contact with people there and I worked with Google to write a book, which was pretty dang awesome. You know, that's just another one of those things where you just, just reach out, talk to people, try anything that you can because at the end of the day, the people that, that are rewarded are those that take risks. You know, it, there's so many people that like, when I went and talked with them later on, they're like, wait, what? You got in contact with Google? You actually work with Google? They, they talk to people, they exist, there's people there? You know, it was one of those things that you just, I just, just decided I was gonna try and do it, right? Why not? Why not reach out there? So that's just kind of another little idea out there to try. 
A um, couple other little topics here. I'm a big fan of obviously using technology. Um, one of the, uh, a couple of, because I'm a tech guy, I always have ideas about using technology because I'm a coder. I can build things online, right? You know, it's one of those things that if you can dream it, I can build it. So I, uh, affiliate marketing, basically the way affiliate marketing works is you join a program like Google AdSense. You put AdSense on a blog, you get paid every single time someone comes to your site. It could be five cents, it could be 20 cents, it could be, you know, whatever else. Well, if you take all these different systems and put them together, all of a sudden you can build, one of the ones I built was a, a garage sale network, which automatically pulled posts from Craigslist and parsed it out into cities. And so then I have all the, I had thousands of sites that was automatically pulling data onto this garage shell network, and it just had AdSense on it. And every single day, I just watched money going to my bank, my bank account. You know, it's sort of this idea where you take technology and you, you you're creative with it. You you're like, how can I how can I use different pieces and put those together in a way that can make me money? Um, that was one of my more successful uh, technology endeavors. Like, you need to have a plan. I'm a big proponent of having plans. You need to jump in. Um, but it, it's good to have people that can plan. Like Troy, he's 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 a thinker. I'm a planner, you know, Troy will come to me all the time, we'll just sit down, or John, and we'll just have these ideas, and you know, I'll sit down and I'll take them all and I'll consolidate them all and create them into some sort of plan about what it is that we're gonna do. If you can plan, then you're gonna be a lot more successful than if you just jump into something. That's not to say you can't be successful, because um, there's many, many examples of people that just jump right in and make it all work. But if you can make plans, come up with a business plan, protect yourself with contracts, um, those are things that are gonna be useful down the line. Um, it is very tempting to, to go into any arrangement with a client without putting contract together, especially when you're first starting. It's not very difficult to get a simple contract together. You can use something like EcoSign or some of these other online systems. Just write up a simple contract that will help, not, not only, it's not just a legal thing, even if you just write it up yourself, it can help to um, manage expectations with your clients. So that if there's any problem down the line, which is, it's gonna happen, you're gonna have these ones over here. <laughs> you know, if that happens, you can always go back and say, you know, I'm sorry this isn't working. This is what we agreed to do. Let's see if we can work on getting this together. And that way there's no misunderstanding. If you, if you set that up in advance too, it's gonna be a whole lot better. Um, one other thing kind of along these lines. Um, having a process in place has really helped a lot in things like, um, like Oski Blue and building websites. Like, you know, I have at Oski Blue um, a pretty defined process that we would go through when we build sites for our clients. And I give that to our clients right when we start, right from the beginning. This is what you can expect from Oski Blue. I have a document that says, communication and support from Oski Blue. We try to help you out 24 hours a day, but we have families. We're here eight to five. That's when you can expect to get help from us. After hours, we'll make our best effort to get to help you out. And we send that to our clients right when they sign up, right from the very beginning, so that they understand, here's the expectation, you know, this is what we're trying to do for you. We don't want to, we don't, and if you set that up right at the beginning about like sort of the expectations, you're gonna go a whole lot better on the, on the process with it. Keeping customers happy. Now this is a like, you could have multiple week <laughs> workshops on keeping customers happy. <laughs> I'm sure each of you in here have your own stories about, you know, successful um, experiences with business as well as unsuccessful um, experiences. I have a couple of principles that I, I really try to live by. One of them I actually got at UNC. We had what we called the hero model at UNC, um, where I, in the uh, Department of Arts and Sciences. We, we called it the hero model. Basically what it was is, if you can do something for a client within reasonable expectations, you do it. Whether it's your job or not, whether it's underneath the contract or not, you do whatever you can to keep somebody happy. If you can keep a client happy, even if it's, you know, if it's gonna cost you an extra 50 bucks, and they're paying you, you know, five grand, then an extra 50 bucks of your time to do something that may not be contracted for, but you know how to do, like help them with their email, help them to do this or that, can really go a long way for keeping clients happy, for making clients so that not only they love you, but you love being with them because they're so grateful for your help and your service. Now, there's, there's always gonna be people that you go the extra mile for, and they're gonna demand more and demand more, they definitely earn that 20%. Or that 80% if you want to get rid of the, the take, you know, 20% take 80% of your time for sending down here. But going the extra mile with your clients can make such a huge difference. And it can also be the thing that differentiates you from so many others. When you're, um, when there's so many options out there for website companies or for IT service professionals or for whatever it is that you're doing, if you're <coughs> starting a business, then you need to be able to differentiate yourself somehow. That's kind of a big one. Here, let me finish off because I want to make sure I give um, John some time. Here are some of my favorite things right now 
web apps that we that I use on a regular basis. Okay, these are uh, this includes like every day I use this stuff. Um, Asana is a project management system. It's free. We use that for managing all of OSCE Blue and all the projects that we do. Fantastic program. Um, highly, highly recommend it. It's free for up to, I think, 15 people in your group. So if you're just getting started and you need a way to manage stuff, look at us, um, Asana. Harvest is a time tracking tool. You need to know the data about your business. Harvest, um, basically, you can set it up to where every single project is tracked down to every single client. You can even set up automated billing through here for your clients so that if you work a certain number of hours, if you're an hourly type of business, Harvest is a great app. We, we don't typically bill hourly, but I want to know how much I spent on a project. This, is, this all goes back to the data, you know, like if we're selling websites for two grand and it ends up costing us two grand, that's not a great website to be building for people. You're just, you're just working down here and you're just not making any money at all. You need to be able to know that, hey, on that website that we built, it ended up costing us $800 and uh, we charged them three grand, so that's great. We, we made this extra money from that, so it's important to have that. Help Scout is a, is a shared task system. There's a lot of um, support systems out there. That happens to be the one that we use. Um, it's fantastic for basically, uh, if you're doing communication with, with clients, the second that it gets beyond you, you, you will, if you're doing all your communication in email, it can become lost. You don't know what's going on. Someone else needs to step in and take over <coughs> a project. You don't know where it's at. You don't know what was said, what was promised. This is a shared system that lets you basically have a shared ticket, support, whatever communication you do. WordPress, I'm a huge WordPress fan. If you're building a website and you need to use WordPress, John will talk more about this. DaVinci is a, this is uh, getting into sort of the virtual stuff. It's a service that uh, allows you to have an answering service, makes oh, it look wow. like you're professional, and you have an office. If you're working remotely or, you know, from home, <coughs> or you, work, you have a home office, it's a great way to, to be more professional. BidSketch allows you to create proposals very, very fast. If you're working on proposals and you need that to be done, EcoSign is that last one I mentioned where you can set up, set up contracts and people can sign it online. But they're all about $15 a month. They're all affordable, you know, somewhere between $10 and $20 a month. Okay, that's kind of the end of my stuff. Any questions for me? The tech guy, production guy? A little history of OSCE Blue. We've not always, we've been around for about four and a half years. We weren't always called OSCE Blue. <laughs> Our company was originally called East Texas Biz. We started out in Tyler, Texas. And what it originally was is Troy and I started this company where it was uh, just a website that sold like advertising on it. Just imagine like an, on, an online uh, directory. And within like the first six months, we were going and it, it was a smaller area. And we found out as I was going to tell people to sell advertising, uh, I'd go up to them and I'm like, hey, you want to advertise my <coughs> website? All right. Hey, do you know how to uh, edit my Facebook page? <laughs> and uh, I was like, I didn't, but I do know how to use Google. And so you, you know, you just go to Google and it's like set up a business Facebook page. <laughs> so you know, I'd sit there for five minutes and I'd set them up a page. And I found out that while I'm trying to sell people, they're like, Can you set up my Facebook page? Well, I was like, All right. All of a sudden, I was like, Oh yeah, we charge two hundred fifty dollars for that. And so I called Troy. I was like, Oh, we we sell. Facebook setup page. Get <laughs> <laughs> uh, those calls all the time. Yes. So what we did is we were a directory. It was East Texas Biz. It was the directory. So after about six months, well, we started getting clients outside of you know we weren't just a directory anymore, and we started getting clients outside of East Texas. And so when we were trying to get clients in Dallas, they're like, "Oh, you're an East Texas company." So I was like, "All right, we got to change our name, Troy." So we're like, all right, we cover all of Texas. So let's we change our name to Texas Biz Solutions. All problems fixed, right? Because we cover the whole state of Texas. And uh, so now you know we're, we're offering where we can set up like your social media. Uh, then someone comes up to me and goes, oh, you know, thanks for setting that up. Do you guys build websites? And one thing I've learned is, for you know, to a degree, you say yes to everything. I was like, oh yeah, we build websites. <laughs> and uh, I don't, to this day, I don't know how to build a website. Troy doesn't know how to build a website. So I, I was okay. like, you yeah, yeah, yeah. you're all right. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's adapting to the market. We, we saw a need. And so, I mean, I, we knew that we had resources. So I was like, yeah, we can build you a website. So sure enough, I, you know, leave the appointment. Hey, Troy, um, we need to find someone that can build a website. And this is what we need to you know, charge for, or you know, charge them you know, so we can make money. So you know, we, and we, we still provide a great service. And, and three weeks later, they had a website, and you know, we just found that need. Well, so we're, 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 everything's going great, right? You know, we moved to Frisco, <coughs> Texas Fist Solutions, and we actually had a few clients from North Carolina. And we, start, uh, we started asking for some referrals. 
And what we found out was, they're like, oh, we love your company. Um, but when they heard we use a Texas company, that's a huge turnoff. Mm. I'm, I'm, you know, we're proud of our Texas roots, but guess what? People outside of Texas don't love Texas. That's what? Crazy. Yeah, believe it or not, Mark. <gasps> True story. They were here to succeed. So what we decided, all right, we, you know, we, here we, you know, we've only been around two years. We've changed our name, you know, twice already. So I, I go to Troy, and I'm not a marketing guy. I was like, Troy, just name the company whatever you want. I was like, my favorite color is blue. I want to wear blue clothes. So just name it whatever you want. So Oski is Troy's real dog. He does exist, or that's his dog, the name Oski, and so the company became Oski Blue. So that's a little history of the company, and also to educate you on adapting to a market because you know a lot of people are going, well, I don't know where to start. Troy and I didn't know where to start. We just knew that we're going to go out there and we're going to find what people need and you'll slowly kind of adapt. We started from having an online directory, then we're offering building, you know, social media pages to building websites, you know, to now we, you know, do search engine optimization, SEO. And now we even do, so, you know, software development. You know, we have to adapt to the market of what people will do. What you have to do now is you have to get out there. Um, my wife and I, you know, we go on kicks of what shows we watch, and we've been watching um, How I Met Your Mother. Has anyone watched that show? Okay, only one person. So <laughs> only one person will get this. But there's a, okay, there's, I, I can't think of his name, the architect. Yeah. Um, anyways. Ted. Ted, yeah, Ted Mosby. So he's this architect, he's starting a business, and he's just spending all this time on designing his, you know, his, his logo, designing his website, you know, deciding what paint he should use, you know, designing how the contract should look, you know, all his marketing materials, and he just finally, he never actually gets out. Really, more than anything, you just need to go out there. You know, it's like, well, I, I gotta make sure I have the perfect pitch. I gotta know who my ideal client is. No, just go out and market yourself. I mean, the best thing you can do is go knock on a door. That's what I did. My goal, I mean, I would report back to Troy. I was like, here's the 70 business cards that I collected. I knocked on 70 doors today. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I would do. It's just, I'd go and I knocked on every door. Uh, a good resource locally, has anyone used Meetup? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how yeah. I came here. Okay, we have some meetup people here tonight. All right, meetup I highly, highly recommend. Troy introduced me to meetup. I didn't realize how powerful a tool. It's free, mm -hmm. you know, just meetup, M E E T U P dot -E -E -T -U -P com. Uh, it's a website. Yeah, website. <coughs> so, what meetup is, is, you know, initially when Troy told me, I was like, well, I'm already married, you know, I'm not looking for a <laughs> 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 But what, what it is, is it's a resource where it, you find people that are interested in biking, interested in hiking. But more importantly, you find network groups that say, we are the North, North Collin County Network Group. We are the Morning Network Group. We are a BNI group. We are the Toastmasters group. And you can find groups, I mean, very quickly that are opportunities to meet people because you just need to go out and meet people. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time, they're all free. They go and all meet at a IHOP early in the morning and. 30 people get together, and that's better. You know, before 9 a.m., I get to interact with 30 other business people that I can sell my services and vice versa. Uh, Meetup's great. LinkedIn, is anyone not on LinkedIn? You need to be on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably one of your best assets as an individual. I, I tell people that, I know this crowd might be a little older, but my goal is when my daughter turns like 18, I'm gonna get her a LinkedIn profile and just start building it up. Because if, if Troy and Jeff fire me tomorrow, I feel my, I have an asset that my LinkedIn, my you know, thousand connections, my endorsements, you know, my recommendations, I can kind of take that with me. You know, that's not something that Oski Blue gets to keep. It's, it's something that you individually get to keep. It's a very, very powerful tool. Um, and it's a lot of, you know, LinkedIn I call it social media for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just, you know, it's just extremely powerful. So those are some of the best resources, knocking doors, use Meetup, uh, LinkedIn, you know, making sure, oh, another great one is Chamber of Commerce. Oh. Uh, people don't, oh, it's, we're a member of four chambers, uh, Little Elm, Plano, McKinney, Frisco. One I'm most active in is Frisco. If you guys don't know, we are in a hotbed of business. Um, Big surprise, right? Frisco. Yeah. yeah, Frisco. So Frisco Chamber, just giving an example, plug for them. Uh, you can join the chamber for like 35 bucks a month. To me, that's very inexpensive market. Mm -hmm. um, what comes with that is, you know, you can go to ribbon cuttings, different events. The thing I love is every Thursday morning at 7.30 to 9, about 100 plus people go to the chamber 
and they all get a 30 second commercial. It was today, I was there this morning, there's about 105 people. And so imagine before nine o'clock interacting with another 100 business owners, from carpet cleaners to attorneys to insurance to auto repair shops, AC, website companies, you're all in there and you, know, you stand up and give a 30 second commercial and you network and it's a great resource to create business, get your name out in the community, um, get contacts with people. So joining your local chamber is, is a great resource. I would highly, highly recommend. So here's something to understand, build up your business and personal identity. All right, so let's go into personal and then I'll go into your bit, uh, business. Your personal identity, um, branding is extremely, extremely important. Okay, uh, it's just, uh, I can't emphasize this. We were at a job fair and I got 17 applications of people I plan to interview. So here they are, I go, oh, took them to Jeff, like, man, well, I got 17 people I want to interview and look good. After I went to Facebook, I only wanted to interview three of them. And then, so, and people look at this, and I, I had this gentleman, who was actually at this school, he came up to me, he goes, you know, that's, that's not right. You shouldn't be judging people by, you know, their Facebook or their online profile. Or not. And this is how I look at it, is, okay, well, I want you, to spend five thousand dollars an employee, and I don't want you to question anything about them. You just, you know, I'll just pick the person that, you know, at, at part, you know, whoever. It's when it's coming out of your pocket. Yeah, then it's your decision. Yeah, it, I can't take the risk. I can't take the risk of going. All right, I'm going to pay someone five thousand a month, and then I find out that, you know, it looks like they this is their fifth city in the last eight months. Um, you know, or you know, the, a lot of different uh, you know, things. I've seen that they're, they're always up till 3 a.m. And it's like, I have clients that expect us to be in the office at a.m. and take calls. And if you're, you're not coming in, that's great. You know, you just, you lost your job, but we lost a client that's paying us 2,000 a month. Right, right, right. So, no, you better believe we're not going to take that risk. And uh, it's it, expected at every level, at every level, from a small company to a large, really important what you do and uh, I just highly caution it uh, because you just don't realize I wouldn't say if someone is I just plan on they're going to look you up okay and before I go to a sales meeting I can always say I've done this for probably over three straight years every sales appointment I go to I've googled their name mm -hmm. I look them up on LinkedIn I look them on Facebook why because I want to go into that appointment before I meet Mark I know that he's a TCU fan I, I, so I know that I'm going to bring up the Horned Frogs. Uh, I, I know that he used to play lacrosse, and so I'm going to bring up lacrosse, and I'm going to control that conversation. He doesn't even know it. And so, you know, I use it as a sales technique as mm -hmm. uh, what, what I want to do. Yeah, rather, the last thing he wants to hear is like, oh, man, did you see Baylor win the other night? And he's like, what? He hates Baylor. <laughs> you know, so you can use it in two different ways. So making sure your online presence is a good representation of what you want to uh, be putting out there. So jump into business uh, identity. This is where I, I think it's really important. If you're going to start up a, a, a business and you hate Facebook, you hate Twitter, that's totally okay. But what you do need to do is you need to claim your assets. So let me give you an example. Let's say we start Oski Blue Up and we build a website. And we're like, hey, we just hate Twitter. And we're, we're running along good. And six months later, we're like, you know what? Maybe we want to do Twitter. So we go to Twitter and we want to get the domain, you know, the name Oski Blue. Well, someone took it, and who took it? Because we're the only people in the, the entire field. People. We're not. Somebody who wanted it. Someone to you. And then competitors. It's someone in the Philippines. Oh. And someone in the Philippines has the Twitter page Oski Blue, and so I'll reach out to them, and it's dormant. They're not doing anything with it. And Twitter pages are free, and so you know we send them a message. Hey. Uh, we know you're not doing anything. Can uh, you know? Can we use this uh, Oski Blue or you know, pay you five bucks? Yes, for seven hundred fifty bucks, you can have this Twitter account. So yeah. people are squatting on Twitter to lose? Oh, oh, on everything oh. on Twitter, oh, Facebook. I know they do it on websites, yeah, like, but I didn't realize they were doing it for. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. So well, even they, more they, so on there because it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah, there's softwares out there that they can look at what domains they bought and after oh, they see that. Oh, that's crazy. So there's people in the Philippines that are literally just waiting. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, but they're just going to go and buy your digital assets so that if you want them, you've got to buy them back. And if you don't have deep pockets, you know, you're not a MasterCard or American Express, you know, and you can fight the legal system, you, you just lost it. So all of a sudden, now we have Oski Blue website and our Twitter page is Oski Blue One. 
And okay. our Facebook page is Oski Blue Dash Frisco, you know, because it, all the other ones were taken. You want to go and claim all your assets. But these are free, and you need to claim all of them. <coughs> your Facebook business page, your Twitter, mm -hmm. your YouTube. Oh, YouTube, oh, I didn't your, hear about that one. Your Google Plus is free. Not in Parrot, but then you might want to go into uh, uh, Pinterest. But usually those four, for if no other reason, those are Maybe LinkedIn. Yep, LinkedIn, yes. Okay. But those are authoritative links also. So what they do by setting them up and linking them back to your website, it's also for SEO purposes that helps you rank higher. Because that's what's going to pull up. Like if you search Oski Blue, here's another reason why you do it. If I type in Oski Blue, Google starts to read that it's a website company. And let's say we didn't claim our social media assets. We, here's ours, and right below it would pull up our competitors. Mm. And even though you typed in Oski Blue. Oh. But because we claimed them, when you type in Oski Blue, our website pulls up, our Facebook page, our LinkedIn, our YouTube, our Google Plus, um, then our, our, our links to like the Frisco Chamber, those pop up rather than like your competitor. Because I know competitors that haven't claimed it, their website pops up and then it's just all these other competitors because they have no other digital assets. We appreciate you all having us. Uh, hopefully it was helpful. Thanks so much for